<laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It is a pleasure to see you today. Um, I'm going to do something dangerous, lay the Bible aside for a moment. <laughs> you see a preacher do that? Anyway, I've um, been giving a daunting task today. It is trying to, trying to convey to you the, uh, the importance and um, the, the outcome of something Martin Luther did years and years ago. It's something that still yet affects us into the year 2012. And we'll try and share as much as possible. Who in here has ever been perturbed by or when you see a social injustice? Anyone? Social injustices. They irritate us, right? Uh, who in here has ever um, just gotten angry or upset when you see um, someone running religiously but contrary to what the Bible actually teaches? Does that irritate and make us mad and upset us? Okay. Well, who among us, though, would actually stand up and say something about it? Well, some of us might, some of us might not. Some of us might talk to our friends about it but never make some sort of public declaration. Who would be willing, though, to stand up and open up a potential or proverbial can of worms about whatever topic or social injustice you see? Well, some of us might again, some of us might not. But once you do start that, then conviction is what keeps you focused, right? Conviction. You really believe this, so you're going to stand up and not allow anyone to daunt you, or you will not be daunted by anybody who is trying to say to you something otherwise. But if we did stand up, and if we did create some sort of... of uh, an eruption in the normal way things are flowing, who would be able to produce some sort of far-reaching, worldwide, social, religious um, revolution? We might say, well, I don't know if I could ever really do that, unless your name is Martin Luther, and unless you tag 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg. That's why we're looking at what, we're, what we are today. This is a very important kind of uh, uh, period in, in history. Now, as far as taking historical Christian documents and comparing them, we, we have to differentiate the fact of Martin Luther's 95 Theses to other creedal or to creedal literature because the 95 Theses of Martin Luther were not intended by Martin Luther to be some sort of basis for a religious system. All right? So keep that in mind, too. Uh, this was, from an academic perspective, an open invitation for anyone to come and discuss the, uh, the relevance of the 95 articles that were under contention or under scrutiny by Martin Luther. So if, in fact, he said, hey, we want to talk about this, it was almost like saying, I want to produce an open environment where freedom of inquiry is allowed to kind of permeate the entire conversation, and uh, we want to get somewhere, and um, not necessarily to, to stand opposed as much as it was to start a, start a dialogue, start a discussion. So that's what Martin Luther is seeking to do. Now, we have to appreciate the 95 Theses of Martin Luther, because what we're dealing with here is something that grants us an insight into uh, 16th century religious world in that day and time. And especially as it relates to how the Roman Catholic Church was dominating with certain views and certain acts of their governance, as well as the way they funded certain works of the church. So that's what gives us insight in this. And we're dealing here with a very rich, very rich context. Uh, this does set the tone for what we know as a religious reformation. Um, and if you go from 1517 to 1521, you have got a powerful four years that opened up a door that we still yet today are able to relate to because of what it brought about. All right, now having said all that, uh, this discussion presupposes that you understand certain terms that I may or may not use, but probably will use, terms like purgatory. We say, that's not biblical. We only study that because we have no, no, there's no bearing for my life in the concept of purgatory. But you have to understand what purgatory was in that day and time to them. Is a very powerful, dominant idea that if I'm not just where I need to be with God, and we are trying to make this practical, by the way, if I'm not where I need to be with God, then I'm going to go to a place that's not heaven and not necessarily hell. It's kind of an intermediary place or inter intermediate place. And uh, one day after I have you know, suffered off my sins, so to speak, I'll then be absolved of those and I can go right on into heaven and be fine. So it's a very real idea that I, I want to go on and be with the Lord, but purgatory was something that was very, very pushed, okay? Now, the second idea would be the selling of indulgences. We're saying, what in the world is an indulgence? Uh, it suggests that the, the sins you commit that are worthy of punishment can be remitted by giving penance or a dollar amount. And once you receive that certification that your sins have been taken away, you have a clear passage for yourself or for those who have passed away. So that's the two concepts that are dominating in this discussion of Martin Luther's uh, 95 Theses. All right? Now, if we are to open the door for discussion the way Martin Luther did, then he is suggesting that as, as an individual who holds a, an academic role, he is trying to say, how do we relate to these things? 
And if we see these as being problematic, are we going to allow those problems to continue? And certainly if the hierarchy of the church saw that these were in fact problems of a biblical nature, then the hierarchy would want to change their views. And so Martin Luther approaches the concepts that we're dealing here with uh, from that perspective. All right? He wants to change things. And he, he believes, I think, in his heart, that if he were to show, make an expression of, in a public fashion, these kinds of problems, that uh, the hierarchy, the Pope, would want to change, in fact, the way things are. Now, if you're reading these topics, and if you're reading, who in here has ever read Nine Theses, besides the academic gentleman in here? Now, students, have you ever read Nine Theses? Okay, you need to get a copy of them if you don't have them. You can download them free, okay? I'm not talking about going out and spending $100 for something. Download them, look at them, and you're going to pick up on some topics like repentance. Uh, you, could, you could say to a degree, you know, faith in there, but repentance. Um, the idea of the selling and practice of selling and buying indulgences, uh, wickedness of the priests, the concept of purgatory and, and, and uh, you know, sin and things of this nature. But also, it teaches us about the Roman Catholic views or doctrinal teachings about things like death and eternity and how the people of the day, the average, common, good people of the day, that he would you know, call the salt of the earth, salt of the earth, they were being victimized by fear and they could purchase their way out of that fear through the dollar. And so when we look at these, and we're going to look at just a few of them so you'll have some sort of bearing. Um, if I get through this and start running out of time, I'll probably just rattle them off to you so you'll have some understanding of the overall uh, 4 to 10 or 12 years. All right. Let me give you a few of these that I thought were notable. Number 10, those priests act ignorantly and wickedly who, in the case of the dying, reserve canonical penalties for purgatory. And we're not going to describe these or, or define them really, we're just going to read through them. Uh, number 11, those tares of changing the canonical penalty to the penalty of purgatory were evidently sown while the bishops were sleeping. Well, that's pretty stout. They didn't know it or else they ignored it. You know, something was going on that this actually came about. Number 20, therefore the Pope, when he uses the words plenary remission of all penalties, does not actually mean all penalties, but only those imposed by himself. That's a little more, you know, condemnation language. We start picking up on something that could be considered a condemnation to uh, the Pope. Number 32, those who believe that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgent letters will be eternally damned together with their teachers. So it's not just them, but the ones who gave those indulgent letters to them to make them think that that sort of you know, encapsulates the idea of biblical repentance. Got the paper, I'm okay, I'll live however I want to, you know, that, that kind of thing. It doesn't get to really the heart of the, uh, the matter. Uh, number 36, any truly repentant Christian has a right to full remission of penalty and guilt even without indulgent letters. See that? And, and that would be totally opposed to the teaching, preaching of John Tetzel, which we see trying to creep his way in, and that Martin Luther doesn't stand for that kind of thing. He sees no biblical uh, relevance between what the church was doing versus what the Bible actually teaches. That's where he comes up with the concept of sola scriptura, or scriptures um, alone. Uh, 49 through 51, really quick. Christians are to be taught that papal indulgences are useful only if they do not put their trust in them, but very harmful if they lose their fear of God because of them. That's a beautiful concept. Uh, Christians are to be taught that the Pope, if the Pope knew the exactions of the indulgent preachers, he would rather that the Basilica of St. Peter were burned to ashes than built up with the skin, flesh, and bones of his sheep. In other words, he surely, surely, you know, he doesn't know that, uh, unless he's being facetious. Number 51, Christians are to be taught that the Pope would and should wish to give of his own money, even though he had to sell the Basilica of St. Peter to many of those from whom certain hawkers of indulgences cajole the money. All right, so that, that gives you a little insight into the kinds of things that he's actually trying to say. Now, this is the Nine Five Theses. These, these concepts are just a sampling of the whole. What do they represent to us? What did they produce? Now, let's go back for a minute and realize, yes, Nine Five Theses do continue to impact our lives today, uh, but how did we get to the point we're in in 2012? Going back to the you know, 1500s, we start to pick up on uh, the, the kind of ripeness that existed for Martin Luther to, to pick this fruit and start taking a bite out of it. So how did we actually get here? May 2nd, 1507, Martin Luther took the vows and became um, uh, a monk priest of the Augustinian order, and uh, he immediately became zealous for looking into theology um, of men like Augustine, Occam, and uh, Bernard. 
He would even memorize entire works. I mean, we're talking about a zeal that cannot be ignored. All right. So zealous was he that one year later, the church, the University of Wittenberg, a new university, took notice of his scholarship, and um, they actually gave him a chair as a philosophy professor there at Wittenberg. And so he is already the golden child of the Roman Catholic Church in this day and time. And a little further on, 1510. Martin Luther does something that changes his entire course, his entire structure of a, a spiritual sort. He visits Rome. He finds a wickedness that is permeating the, the activities of the Roman priests, and uh, it upsets him, especially when he sees that people, common people, are being sold these, these you know, certificates of indulgence that permit you know, a, a loved one from 30 years ago to escape purgatory. You know, they give everything they have just to help their, their dead or deceased family member. October 19, 1512, uh, Martin Luther receives a doctoral degree in theology. This is his true love. Philosophy was a tool that would help him understand the depths of theology a bit more. And um, he considered himself now the theologian that was his focus in every sense from this point on. And he calls this now the, uh, the search of the kernel of the nut. So now I'm a theologian. You know, now I'm able to do uh, some great things. Now, I have to realize... Martin Luther was not trying to uh, to suppose, nor did he nor, nor did he assume that the corruption he saw in the Roman Catholic Church was in any way able to shake his faith in the church because there is a bigger picture out there. He may have seen some lower level you know priests doing some things that weren't right, but surely the love that the church has, the hierarchy the Pope has for good and truth, would overpower what he saw in the uh, in the in the. Uh, Temporal. So the sinfulness of priests was not going to be overshadowed by the greatness of what the church actually stood for. So in standing up for what he believed the Bible taught regarding these theses um, was going to be not by him considered a strike against the Roman Catholic Church, but instead one that would help um, to point out the abuses against her name. And that's what he was seeking to do. So that's why we call this really a reformation. He was seeking to reform something instead of what we would say is necessary in restoring back to New Testament uh, Christianity. So what would you do if you're Martin Luther? Well, you might write some letters to men that are a little higher up than you are, uh, archbishops or bishops, and you might talk to uh, the gentleman at Brandenburg or Maine. That's the way he did. And you would, you would suggest to them there is a massive difference between biblical repentance that affects the entire individual's heart all the way out into activities of the, uh, the human being, Versus an indulgence whole, you know, certificate you hold on to that says my repentance has already been taken care of, or my penance has been taken care of now. The, the trust then becomes, like he said in one of his uh, declarations there, the trust becomes in what I have based on what I have paid for it instead of a relationship that is, you know, necessary to to uh, to grow. Now here's the problem: bishops did not receive his words very well. Um, and so what do you do if that happens? Well, if they won't listen, you go public. You talk to the common man that's being affected more than anyone else, and you, you go public with this. And so that's where we come now into a, one of the greatest dates in religious history, by the way. And you'll never forget it, hopefully. Halloween. <laughs> October 31st, 1517. All right, October 31st, 1517. Martin Luther took his 95 theses and tacked those or nailed those to the church door at the Castle Church of Wittenberg in Germany. And uh, forevermore, things have changed from that point on. Now, you might ask the question, what on earth was he doing talking into a church door? That was the community bulletin board, okay? That's your Facebook of the day. That's your, that's your email of the day. This is the way you get words out very, very quickly. This public declaration uh, was seen as an affront against the selling of indulgences, primarily by a gentleman named Johann or John Tetzel. And um, he, he doesn't like it. He's been... A, he's been granted that position by the Pope himself to go into the area of Wittenberg and get these indulgences. Martin Luther said, uh-uh, not having on my watch, not going to let that. And so uh, because of their desire to renovate the St. Peter's Basilica, Martin Luther started recognizing, like we read, and he's like, man, the Pope's got more money in his personal bank account than most of these people around here had put together. If he really cares, let him be the one to take it from his own treasury to renovate St. Peter's um, Basilica. So here's what happens. Next two weeks, Martin Luther shoots to what we might call stardom. It's like he gets on reality TV shows and it goes to the top. Okay. Next two weeks, the 95 Theses not only cover Wittenberg, but they cover Germany. It covers Europe. And things are going crazy. Something's happening, though. 
something is happening. And Martin Luther in his mind is thinking, yes, finally, the people are talking, people are talking, the academic world is talking. When the Pope hears this, the Pope is going to be so impressed that we're able to make these kinds of changes from the grassroots organizations all the way up to the top. Right? Wrong. We have a major issue going on now. Let me give you these uh, quick overviews of some of the history, okay? 1518, the Heidelberg Convention took place. And although he had already had death threats against him, he said, I'm going anyway. I'm going to go talk. So he shows up at Heidelberg. He preaches and teaches on faith and repentance and justification and uh, works. And then, for some reason, the topic of indulgences comes up. And he doesn't assure it back from it. Instead, he attacks it. And he attacks John Tetzel one more time. So this becomes kind of a, uh, an opportunity for the fury or the furor of the uh, situation to even escalate a little bit more. By February of 1518, <laughs> very, very close proximity there, the Pope finally says, okay, here's what we have to do. We have to turn him from his ways. Go in there and convince him to stop preaching and teaching uh, in this manner. So Martin Luther is given the opportunity to recant. All right? Pull back. Quit talking the way you are. Everything will be fine. And Martin Luther said, that can't do that. So that leads us up to this next one. He has a hearing in Augsburg. Now, if you talk about... Are you going to be talking about the Augsburg Confession here at all? Go ahead and talk about it. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm just getting over here. <laughs> but if, you, if you've heard of the Augsburg Confession, this takes place not too long from what's going on right here. But Martin Luther there is in Augsburg, and this is where he makes a famous uh, statement, okay? He says, if I can be convinced that I've said anything in conflict with the understanding of the whole, holy Roman Catholic Church... I will condemn, and I will retract it. That's pretty good. Now, it only has taken one year. So we go up now to October 1518, and just one year later, a friend of his, Staubitz, I guess I'm pronouncing that right, Staubitz, um, actually because of the spiritual conflict Luther was having between his personal convictions and that of the vow he had taken under the Augustinian order, he was absolved of his vow. So that freed Martin Luther from believing that he was doing something contrary to his, his vow to God. Now his conviction was permitted to be to run free. And so this is actually a very helpful kind of thing uh, to him. So now here comes Martin Luther. Martin Luther appeals to Leo X, Pope Leo X. He was a colorful card, by the way. Uh, if you ever read about him, you think the guy who is the supreme vicar or stand-in for Christ would have had the most, almost per perfect kind of... of uh, desire to display perfection. You know. He wants to show forth his spirituality and all this. That wasn't really Leo X at all. He knew more about, <laughs> he knew more about a Greek um, myth than he did about you know, Christian history. And so, so we, have, we have a real conflict of interest here. And so in, in the earlier days, we see Martin Luther thinking, man, if the Pope knew he would stop this stuff, he's tried to work this way, but now the Pope's saying, huh, we're not having that. So he gives Martin Luther you know, this, other, this other ultimatum, and he condemns condemns to the whole world now the attacks against indulgences. He condemns the idea that Luther would say the Pope does not have the power and the authority to absolve sin or to take away, remit sins, even for those in purgatory. And the Pope says, I do in fact have that authority. So don't, don't mess with me, don't mess with the church. And Martin Luther, he's, he's, a, he's a pebble in our shoe. We're not going to have this anymore. And so now with the ultimatum that's been presented, we have 1521, the assembly or the diet, of Worms, not worm, Worms, uh, comes in, and he once more is given the opportunity to defend his views. He refuses to defend by recanting, and because of that, this is the, this is the real break now. The uh, Martin Luther is excommunicated from the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Man, you imagine how that feels. I suspect that the you know when you're within a uh, a system and you feel pressure from those on the top, you tend to feel like the entire world is caving in around you. The fact that Martin Luther had by this time stepped aside from the vow he made to the Augustinian order, I think probably gave him a more liberating view of what his life was becoming now. He saw changes that were being made. And with these changes, we are the recipients of great blessings Okay, in the year 2012. So keep that kind of thing in mind. This is where uh, Frederick of Saxony, a good friend of his, thankfully he had good friends in high places, took him into his... Uh, Ortberg took him into uh, giving him what solace, giving him sanctuary from the outside world, the influences, and the negative potential impact for Martin Luther's life. And that's where Martin Luther was able to accomplish a, a powerful feat of translating the Bible into his own native tongue, German, for the common people. This is a this is, this in and of itself is a beautiful time 
in uh, church history because I could be wrong here, and that's fine. I, I can be wrong. Uh, I believe that was one of the first translations into a native tongue. So, I mean, we're, we're talking about something that's, I mean, this, this last, you know, five years, ten years, they, they have been magnificent. They have been very, very packed, uh, energized, moving forward by the very same time. For Martin Luther, now I'm sure he's under some, some pretty uh, extreme duress there. Uh, distressed, and you think we're stressed, the finals coming up or whatever. Hey, he had some very serious issues that were facing him, and yet he what? Maintained allegiance to his conviction, and he stood against the status quo. He stood against social injustice. He stood against religious error that he believed with all of his heart uh, was inconsistent to what the Word of God taught. Now, having said all that, what did these 95 theses represent? And what do they represent? And what kind of precedent did they set? I've already given a little bit of that. Uh, to reform is one thing, but to restore is something else. And uh, that, that Reformation concept has led other people to say, let's just get away from this altogether and get back to the Bible. Sola Scriptura was the concept that came, or the statement that came from that mentality, that, that, that attitude. Um, so let me, let me give this to you. This is a simple kind of thing. Even preaching or teaching a very simple biblical concept like repentance was a big deal for him. Is a big deal in that world in that day and time. Because you've got a dominating force that says, this is how it is. This is how it will be. We base ourselves on the teachings of God's Word. And then when you take God's Word and start comparing the two, you see drastic inconsistencies. And so what? who among us would have the, have the um, not only the stamina and conviction, but also just the bravado to stand up and say, this is not right. We can't, this is not how it should be. This is not the intention of God. Here's this Roman Catholic machine that says what they espouse is truth, but then you got the truth right here and something is not adding up. So when he stood up opposed to the, uh, the religious teachings of that day and time, he was positively a maverick. He was perceived as a rebel. He was starting a revolution. And that idea of getting back to God's truth as the sole foundation upon which you live your life, express your ideals, that is something we see really, really starting up to a major degree right here. All right, now the next thing was this. Martin Luther blazed the trail where God's word should be perceived as the absolute standard. We will not, I don't have to fear what men can do to me. And it's the old adage of, you know, yes, they can make your life terrible. They can make you, make you wish you were dead. But if you maintain allegiance to the spiritual conviction that you have, even when the world strikes against you to such a degree that they take your life, isn't it far better to go and be with the Lord? Having stood up for something that becomes a testimony or becomes an example that will stand the test of time, that we still stand up and say Martin Luther did something so, so amazing that we still draw strength from that idea. And finally, the sola scriptura may sound simple to us. And it is simple maybe because we've been educated under that under that, that concept. But back then, it would strike against a selfish dominance that no one had ever stood up to. So I'm just gonna just gonna say it like this. We try to be practical, give you an overview and, and hopefully what? Bring about a curiosity for you to dig much, much deeper than what we can do in twenty five minutes here. But uh, if you've ever been offended by social injustice, take a little lesson from Martin Luther. If you see religious error that's blatantly taught to the exclusion of what God's Word actually says, don't be afraid to stand up for what's right. And you might just, you might just start a movement that gets people closer to God instead of further away from Him by putting their trust in something that is just like the wind, has no substance whatsoever. So appreciate what Martin Luther has done for us. Appreciate the essence of what the 95 Theses um, suggest and represent to us. And um, as you look at some more of these historical Christian documents, uh, appreciate these, these gentlemen who set the, set the tone for something we have uh, come to be blessed by today. I appreciate it very, very much. And uh, God speak to you. Amen. Amen. Thank you.